Welcome everybody. So good to see so many enthusiastic people in the morning. Please, uh, as you sign in, feel free to let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. We like to know what geographical region is being represented in these forums. So please feel free to put something. We have Lincoln, Rhode Island. Welcome, Rhode Island. Anybody from other places, Melrose, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, Massachusetts again, Newberry, great, excellent. Brockton, nice, Franklin, good, good to see all of you. And now they're coming in fast and furiously. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our age-friendly employer forum. And I'm Miriam Diamond. I'm the program director of the Encore Boston Network. I would like to thank our sponsors of today's meeting. It takes a village to put together today's program. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Well, as we're waiting for the next slide, I will tell you who our collaborators are. Our collaborators, in addition to the Encore Boston Network, include ARP and retirementjobs.com. We also have collaborators from the uh, 50 plus job seekers. We have the City of Boston Age Strong Commission, the Massachusetts Executive Office of Elder Affairs, Operation ABLE, and the Age Friendly Institute. There they all are. So I really want to thank all of you for making this possible. So this Age Friendly Employer Series is one in which we recognize and feature age-friendly employers, people who are willing and eager to hire all of you. So we wanna introduce them to job seekers. We hope to encourage other employers to also be friendly to people age 50 and over, and to show that being designated age-friendly is a way to help find really good employees. So our goals today are to highlight employers that meet the standards of being age-friendly. And we'll hear a little more about that shortly and what that means. And connect the employers with the job seekers. We want to introduce the job seekers to the initiatives that are age-friendly, AARP and CAFE, and how these initiatives can help you in your job hunt. We are looking for a broader adaptation uh, or adoption of age-friendly status. And we want to help job seekers have hope, direction, confidence, and offset barriers for ageism. So we don't have to be afraid of who we are and what we've lived and what our experience is. We're recording this session, so you can view it again if you didn't catch something and you want to know what it is or what did they say. Uh, feel free to look in your mailbox in the next week or so, and we will send you this information. We will have both the slides and the recording available for you, as well as contact information for all our speakers. Please use the chat function as you're all doing such a wonderful job doing already with any comments, any suggestions, and any questions throughout the program. We will have a Q&A session at the end, but you don't have to wait till the end to list it. Please write question before your question in capital letters, and then we'll find it later on when we're looking for our questions. So that is a request. So let me tell you about today's agenda. I'm very excited about our moderator, Carol Harvey, and I will introduce her in just a minute. Uh, after we meet Carol, we will get the outline of the AARP and CAFE employer pledges about what is age-friendly and what makes an age-friendly business. We'll hear about job training opportunities, particularly through Roxbury Community College, and understand what's going on at some of the community colleges in the, in the state and we'll meet today's featured age-friendly employers. And today's organizations that are being representative are WAVE, LaSalle Village, MS General Brigham Hospitals. After that, there'll be some general questions of panelists, and finally, your questions will be answered. So let's get going. I want to introduce the moderator for today's event, Dr. Carol Harvey. Dr. Harvey serves on the AARP Massachusetts Executive Council. She works to combat workplace ageism and help older workers find meaningful employment. So she's the perfect moderator for today. She's Professor Emerita of Assumption University, where she taught classes on management, organizational behavior, and diversity. 
She has many publications on business and learning, and especially the book, Understanding and Managing Diversity. So Carol, welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Miriam. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're so happy to have you join us on this important and timely conversation. Over the past few years, the economy and the job market have been, gone through some extreme changes, and we're looking ahead to even more changes in the coming months and years. The good news is that unemployment has gone down, but we know that these results are an unevenly distrib distributed, especially for people over 50. Some people have found jobs they're happy with, Others have found jobs that don't fully or appropriately use their skill sets and experience. Others have yet to find work, and I'm sure many of those listening in today are in that category. So there's good news and there's bad news in the current job market for mature workers. But there's one broad trend we want to focus on today. The shortage of skilled workers has encouraged larger numbers of employers to look more carefully at the experience of mature workers. This growing share of employers understands the value of older workers, what they bring to the workforce, and they have intentionally set out to recruit and retain them. And that is why we are here today. Our purpose today is to showcase workforce training program, a workforce training program at Roxbury Community College, and then to have presentations by our three age-friendly employers. Each of these employers has taken two specific steps to qualify for today's panel. One, they have signed an AARP employer pledge, and two, they qualified as a certified age-friendly employer with the CAFE program. And we'll hear more about these two programs in a minute. We are proud that this is the seventh age-friendly employer forum that we have offered over the past three years. We've showcased over 20 employers who continue to hire people over 50. We encourage you to check the positions they have available We'll send you a list of these employers in a follow-up email, and you can also find them listed on Encore Boston Network's website under age-friendly employers. Next, we want to share information about the AARP Pledge Program and the Certified Age-Friendly Employer Program. All of our panelists have participated in these forums, and including those we'll meet today. All have been approved by both CAFE and AARP. Today, we, there are two colleagues with us today whose organizations work to support older workers. Kara Cohen, Manager for Community Outreach and Volunteer Engagement for AARP Massachusetts, will talk about the AARP Pledge Program. Then Tim Driver, President of Age Friendly Institute, will talk about his CAFE program. Kara? All right, Carol. Thank you. Um, thanks for being with us today and making time to join us for this program. Uh, AARP Massachusetts is happy to once again be one of the sponsors uh, of this event brought to you by the Encore Boston Network. Uh, as Carol said, I'm the manager of outreach and volunteer engagement at AARP Massachusetts. Uh, I'm so pleased that Carol is moderating this too. She's on our AARP Executive Council, as you heard. Uh, she's super qualified for this topic. Um, so as you may know, AARP is the largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering Americans 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. Uh, AARP works to strengthen communities. We uh, fight for what matters for families the most. Uh, we have a focus on health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. Uh, on the advocacy front, some of our key areas of focus uh, is on lowering the cost of prescription drugs, advocating for nursing home and long-term care reform, and for financial support for caregivers. Now, a critical component of our financial stability work is to ensure that the 50 plus can continue working as long as they want to. To that end, we engage with employers on the value of what we call the multi-generational workforce. And we work to demonstrate the impact of age diversity on the bottom line. Our core initiative in this regard is the ARP Employer Pledge Program. That would be the first slide. Uh, and these employers from around the country stand with ARP in affirming the value of experienced workers and are committed to developing diverse organizations. And since its inception in 2012, the program has actually grown to over a thousand organizations, um, which means we have an employee reach of about 17 million. AARP's work with employers helps organizations move beyond these limited stereotypes about older workers 
towards an age-friendly workplace, a more age-inclusive workplace. And we've vetted um, these employers. They have a good rating with the Better Business Bureau. And also over the last three years, there have been no class action discrimination suits successfully brought against them. So these companies receive regular communications from AARP. They're encouraged to network with each other and also um, get access to webinars and other resources to help them learn how to support older workers. Uh, they're also encouraged to take action steps to demonstrate that they support, support older workers. So yes, now to the second slide. You can search companies on the ARP employer pledge list, uh, search by geography, by company, by industry. Um, and also, next slide, uh, ARP offers resources for experienced workers. Uh, so we have the ARP job board. Uh, there are also great articles that you'll find very relevant. Uh, for example, this one, 20 jobs that will be in demand in 2023. Next slide, please. At ARP.org slash work, um, we also offer tools to help you with your job search. Uh, for example, there's the ARP Skill Builder for Work that helps you gain in-demand skills uh, so that you're competitive in today's job market. You will also find the ARP Resume Advisor, which involves a free resume review as well. Next slide, please. We offer free webinars that are available on demand on a variety of topics, as you can see. For example, one on the positives of part-time work and another on trends older workers uh, should know about in their virtual job market, and another on tackling tough interview questions. All these are free to anyone, whether you're an ARP member or not. So that brings me to the final slide where um, you'll be getting these afterwards, of course. Uh, you can see the key websites that I've pointed out, uh, plus our state website. I know many of you from around the country, so you can find your state website by just putting a different um, uh, trailing URL at the end uh, for your state. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. I'm uh, ready to hand it over. Okay, thank you, Kara. Tim Driver here with the Age Friendly Institute. Delighted to uh, play a role in describing what we call the Certified Age Friendly Employer Program. This program has been in place since 2006 and is growing very quickly. Last year, uh, we actually certified the first state in the United States, which was Massachusetts. Um, and next week, we'll be announcing the second state in the union as a certified age-friendly employer. I will uh, just drill in a little bit on the state of Massachusetts before I go on, uh, which is to say that it was the governor, then Governor Baker, who said that we want to lead by example uh, and establish the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, as an age-friendly employer to encourage other employers to do just the same. And that actually led to uh, former uh, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh and and subsequently the Department of Labor head, Marty Walsh, declaring the Certified Age-Friendly Employer Program a new national model. And both of those sort of validations, if you will, have led to a substantial acceleration of employers around the state and around the country in being certified as age-friendly employers. You can go to the next slide. And I'll describe the, uh, the, the process in a bit more, in a bit more detail. So the program has been around uh, since 2006. As I said, you can sort of compare it to the AARP Employer Pledge. You can compare it also to rating programs like JD Power. Um, it's rooted in compensation and benefits and HR practices. So the uh, organizations uh, or the, the organizations that are, that are part of it have been scrutinized uh, carefully and have been certified using a series of best practices that we established um, again, based on both qualitative and quantitative measures. And we take a series of uh, benchmarks when we put organizations through this, we set a baseline and we expect progress against those benchmarks once they get recertified every, every two years. Uh, so we're very proud of the program. It serves lots of different constituencies. The three most important are 
the individuals themselves, the job seekers, the older adults who really want to save some time by first knocking on the door of employers that are more likely to welcome them than to shun them. And unfortunately, it's still the case in this country that older adults sometimes are uh, less welcome than um, than younger adults. And obviously, one big part of this program and the employer pledge program is to turn that around. And slowly but surely, there is change happening. Not, of course, as fast as all of us would like. Next slide, please. These are the standards by which we measure a certified age-friendly employer. And probably none of them would surprise you. They all have to do with the, old, the whole sort of you know, pie of HR. There are three primary drivers of the employers that are in the program. One that's probably growing the fastest, but is still small, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. This point in time, most, especially larger employers, have a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. It's the smallest of the segments within that initiative is age, but that's changing, and it's changing pretty rapidly. So now it's sort of 10% growing to 20% this year, we believe, that will be adopting age as sort of formally part of the DEI program. And that's one of the reasons it's growing as quickly as it is. The second reason or the second biggest driver of employers is around talent acquisition. It's no surprise that there's a shortage of people to fill jobs around the state of Massachusetts um, and employers are hungrier than they've been probably ever for the, uh, for the age radius and the, the older adult cohort that we're serving here. And then the third of three main drivers is retention. So we have a lot of employers that are a part of the CAFE program. Some of them might be represented here today and you'll hear from them who say, we don't actually have a problem finding people. We have a problem keeping people. And what you might not know is the government data has been proving this for years and years and years. The older adult stays on the job three times longer than a younger adult. So if you're knocking on the door of an employer that has a turnover problem, you are part of their solution. And that's something that you should just know by, go, by, by, just, by, by virtue of your age, you've earned the right to be able to say, yes, I am more likely than a younger adult to stay on the job as much as three times longer. Next slide, please. Um, this is retirementjobs.com. Um, it's a career site for people over 50. Uh, there's more than a million job seeker members nationwide. Uh, some of the employers represented here today are on retirementjobs.com. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs. They're both paid and volunteer. Um, there's a reviews section. Um, there are webinars every other Tuesday evening. Um, on very pertinent topics to this topic of working for jobs when you're over the age of 50. So that's retirementjobs.com. And then the next slide. Um, similarly, on agefriendly.org, uh, which is run by the Age Friendly Institute, you can find um, access to these age-friendly employers, as well as a whole host of other resources around advice and content. And the next slide, and I'll hand it back over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Kara. These are both important programs. And um, as we've mentioned, these slides will be available to you after the, after our finish our program. Lots of things are happening in the workplace. And one of the new new programs that we'd like to talk to you about is one at our community colleges. Um, we are going to hear next from uh, Salvador Pina, and he is the Dean of Workforce Business Development at Roxbury Community College, and he's going to share information about an exciting job training opportunity available at the college. And he'll talk a bit about how you can learn more about the courses and certifications and programs. Salvador? Uh, good morning, everybody. I am so pleased to be here today. Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, I think I, I just wanted to start out by letting you know that, you know, community colleges have uh, historically 
um, um, valued uh, experience and wisdom um, in, and, uh, and, and, and uh, what we see here at Roxbury College is a reflection of that. Uh, we have lots of folks who work at the college um, who uh, have a great amount of experience. And, and, you know, for all of you to think about an opportunity, you have any experience that might dovetail with, with uh, colleges or businesses, right? So there's lots of different areas of a college. But so if you have any experience, you should consider uh, community colleges as a place of employment. Um, I, I can tell you too that as a public institution, um, we uh, we are very clear about our process um, and uh, uh, in terms of hiring, and uh, and we do a lot I think to ensure that our process is fair and equitable. So um, just wanted to start off by telling you that, and then I wanted to get into a little bit about some of the programs that we have here at the college, and then sort of uh, give you a way to find other community colleges in the state. So um, for our programs, we, we, I, I largely work on what's called the non-credit side. So our programs generally are anywhere from 45 hours to maybe 300 hours in terms of training. And uh, they cover a wide gamut of opportunities. Um, you know, there are a number of opportunities in healthcare, um, things like uh, phlebotomy, which is a, a big need in healthcare, and uh, that's a that's a 90-hour program with a 160-hour internship. Those kinds of programs are really important. Um, a, a program that, and I know people, some of you may be interested in sort of remote opportunities, and a, a training program that we have, which uh, uh, can support remote uh, work, is medical billing and coding. Um, that's an online program that we offer, and uh, what we found is there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, hospitals uh, work with other vendors who provide that service for them. So there's lots of opportunity in that area. Um, we do some fun things like event planning. Uh, so if you want to uh, sort of go out onto your own and do some things on your own, there's opportunities to, to learn uh, event planning or another uh, uh, opportunity like that is um, real estate. Uh, we provide a training course so that you can pass the state real estate uh, license. Those are the kinds of jobs I think that sometimes give you flexibility right? It's really important to, I think we're seeing a lot in today's world uh, for uh, uh, folks trying to understand how they can build flexibility in their life so that they have a work-life balance. And that's a, an opportunity for one. Um, another interesting opportunity I think we have is pharmacy technicians. So if you go and pick up, you know, your meds at a CVS or a Walgreens, you know, that person at the window is the pharmacy tech. Um, but pharmacy techs go beyond that because pharmacy techs can work in hospitals. They can do compounding, which is putting the meds together. So for example, like an IV bag in a hospital, they can prepare those kinds of things. So they even give uh, uh, COVID shots uh, and other immunizations at, at, uh, at pharmacies. So there's a lot of, it's a wide range. I don't think people understand you know, that pharmacy technicians can do a lot. Um, uh, and then uh, we have, a, I think, a really new innovative program that we just bring in online is a registered uh, behavioral technician. So if you're interested in working with autistic youth, that's an opportunity to get a, a certification that would allow you to then work with autistic youth. And that's a job where... Um, you'd be able to have some flexibility, again, in terms of travel, the number of students that you might work with or youth that you might work with. Um, and uh, that's a, a nice program because it's a 45 hour program to get the certification and then you can get in. We have a partner, Key Autism, that, does, that works all around the state, by the way. Um, and, and so that, that, uh, uh, that particular certification would uh, be valuable uh, statewide. Um, I think a couple of other things I, I would want to bring to your attention are um, we're also uh, beginning a training program um, for uh, for a, um, uh, a, a for a training in marijuana uh, service. So that that training, I think it's called the cannabis agent training. Um, that training 
uh, allows you to uh, get an understanding of, of the growth cycle, of how to work in medical marijuana, how to work in dispensaries, and it also gives you um, a certification at the end. Uh, so that you become a more, uh, it would allow you to compete better in that industry if you wanted to, to get into that industry. And then finally, um, we're going to be rolling out a program this fall um, for anybody that's interested in working in school systems as a paraprofessional. Um, that's a, a, a job that's badly needed, not only in a Boston public school system, but in school systems uh, throughout the state. Um, paras are essential. Uh, to work uh, in schools and to help uh, and to help teachers uh, do the work. Um, and that's a training program that we'll be rolling out here at the college. Some of our programs you can experience um, there online, like the medical uh, building and coding. Others are what we call hybrid programs where you would do a portion of it on campus and a portion online. And then others are uh, on, uh, on campus. And they, they're at a different, all programs are arranged at different times, some in the morning, some in the afternoon, some in the evening, depending on, on what your interest is. So that's a quick overview of our programs. I'm happy to, uh, to stick around and, and answer specific questions. Um, I did want to do one thing. I'm going to put something in the chat right now um, that I think is really important for everybody. Uh, let's see. I got to get to everyone. There we go. Um, so what I just did was I just pasted in the chat a uh, way to find uh, community colleges throughout the state of Massachusetts. I know some of you are from outside Massachusetts. I didn't have that information, but at least if you're inside Massachusetts, uh, you can click on that link and find your local community college. Um, there are 15 community colleges in Massachusetts, which is unique in the country. There's usually not that many in states, um, but we have them throughout the state. So if you want, want to find, and, and the programs differ, I think that's important to understand. So the programs that we have, uh, Mass Bay Community College or Ma Massasoit or Bristol Community College, they have, may have different programs. So I encourage you to look, uh, look up your local community college and look for programs that uh, you might find helpful. So um, thank you for the opportunity to chat with you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Salvador. A lot of exciting ideas there. Thank you for sharing. Uh, one reminder before we get to our three panelists, and that is, remember, you can put questions in the chat at any time, and we'll have a discussion after each one presents. So this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce each of our panelists. We'll go alphabetically. Each one will have three minutes to speak about his or her organization and to tell you how they engage older workers. Our first speaker will be Sharon Emick, from WAVE, and that's spelled W-A-H-V-E, which is a great anachronism for Work at Home Vintage Experts. Sharon? Thanks, Carol, and it's an honor to be here. So Work at Home Vintage Experts, WAVE, and we call our people WAVES, <laughs> um, and the purpose of it is to really help our aging population, people 50 plus, continue their career in a flexible work environment, basically working from home, whether part-time or full-time. Um, you know, the, the issue with ageism is when you walk in an office um, to, uh, to interview for a job, people see you and they immediately know you're probably over 50, over 60, over 70. The purpose of WAVE is to really take all that off the table. We are a blind qualifying process. What we do is we qualify talent, at a very granular level. We qualify the client at a very granular level as well. And then we match the, the wave to the client based on what the wave wants to do, whether part-time or full-time. And then we they work on a long-term assignment. Some assignments are ready out 10 years, sometimes it's two, three years, and they move, they pick assignments they want to do. And the purpose is to help our aging population extend their careers working from home, doing what they love in a flexible work environment to have the quality of life they deserve after 30 years traveling to the office, office stress, but they have amazing knowledge that they can give back to, you know, to uh, businesses. So we focus mostly in the insurance industry. There are 300,000 open jobs in the insurance industry. There's a huge talent problem. Um, and of course, insurance industry is a knowledge industry, so it requires that people have good backgrounds. Um, and the, the problem is, is that um, companies just can't find the talent. And I agree with Tim, the turnover we hear from clients all the time, 
They hire a young person and a year they're gone because they're not manager already of the whole department. Um, whereas, <clears throat> whereas our people over 50, they've done their career. They don't want to be, they may not even want a promotion anymore. <laughs> they've been there, they've done that. They just want to use their knowledge to continue to work um, as, as they age. So we have over 600 people now working from home for our clients all across the country. And I'll give you a wonderful example. We have a woman, <clears throat> so it's just to debunk the whole myth about older workers and even their tech ability. So we have a woman who is 83. <laughs> our client loves, our client loves her. They think she's probably 55, 60, because they never go to the office. They only see them on like a, a Teams call or a Zoom call visually. Um, and then you can't tell. So, you know, some people 60 look 70, some people 70 look 50. <laughs> All they know is she's amazing and she has amazing technology skills. I said, we can't believe what her tech skills are like. It's absolutely spectacular. Had she walked in that office, she would have never gotten the job. You know, so one of the issues that we're trying to, to solve is that is to remove the, the visual bias because if you just looked at knowledge and talent and expertise, um, that and not look at someone visually, you would hire towards that because that's what you know how you need to fill talent, that businesses need to fill talent gaps. So that's really the, the whole purpose of WAVE. So we are exclusively, are all of our WAVEs are over 50, <laughs> some of them up into their 80s, and they're all still continuing to work using their knowledge. Um, and everybody wins because they continue to support themselves as they age. They never become a burden on their families or society and businesses win because they end up having this amazing knowledge still working for them and even mentoring young people. I mean, these young people need mentors and they need that transfer of knowledge and this way industries don't lose that knowledge. That's basically what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. That's very encouraging. And I hope um, some of our listeners will realize how wonderful it is to have an organization like yours that is specifically geared towards this group of the workforce. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Janet Maragas from La Salle Village. Sharon, uh, Janet? Yes. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for Im inviting me to participate in, the, in this forum. So it's something I'm very excited to talk about. And I'd like to start by telling you a little bit more about La Salle Village and what, what makes us unique in the senior living, as a senior living community. We're located on the campus of LaSalle University, which is a small private university in Newton, Massachusetts. We have 13 acres right on the campus. And we are what's called a continuum of care. And I can explain that a little bit. Um, everybody that moves to the village moves in as a resident in independent living apartments. We have about 225 apartments. Each one is very unique and can be modeled, you know, specifically to what um, our new resident um, is interested in having. Um, in the event that people, you know, may um, experience some overtime cognitive issues or some other types of medical, medical things, the next level of care is what we call supported living, which is similar to assisted living. Nine small studio apartments with around the clock nursing care. And the third level being our skilled nursing floor for people that perhaps are doing just a short term stay um, for rehab. Maybe they've had um, you know, hip replacement, knee surgery, what have you or they become um, a resident on the skilled nursing floor, and then we provide um, end of life care, hospice, et cetera. But I really wanted to highlight what makes us stand out, and that is everybody that moves to LaSalle Village is re required to participate in, in 450 hours of continuing education programs. This was the first model in the country to ever have such a requirement. And in fact, it's, it's actually one of the only ones in the world as well. Our former president is in Sweden at the moment um, talking about this model and you know, the fact that other countries and other you know, states, et cetera, are interested in implementing something like this. So the education can be formal, traditional classes at the university. But it can also take a lot of other forms as well, things like um, participating in a fitness program, gardening, doing art, um, going to concerts, museums, um, listening to a lecture. So it's really varied and 
I think what makes it so wonderful is that it engages people intellectually. It provides a lot of socialization. You know, this is a really vibrant community. And I was really struck by that when I started that it, it's kind of the opposite of what you might think of in senior living. People are engaged and really active and, and doing a lot of things to keep themselves, you know, sharp and interested in the world around them. So in, in terms of our staff, we employ about 180 employees and all the departments that you would imagine in, you know, keeping any type of organization like this up and running, sales and marketing, finance. We have um, HR, um, obviously. We have um, a large nursing staff. We also have an, our education department that, um, excuse me, puts the curriculum and the catalog together. We have a resident programming department. Um, they plan things like our trips to the symphony, to the ballet, um, having political figures come in and talk to the, to the residents, um, classical music, folk music, what have you. So it's a, it's a really busy, you know, kind of exciting environment to, to create a lot of things to keep people energized and engaged. I think that we have, um, I was doing some reports yesterday on some of our demographics. I said we have about 180 employees. Right now we have 60% of our staff over 40 and 42% over 50. And that can be, you know, a lot of different reasons. One is people stay, which I think is true. We have very good retention, but also that we're, um, you know, open and excited about bringing people in who are older. Um, they're um, similar to what Sharon said that they'll stay. I think the turnover is a lot less and it kind of mirrors our community. You know, we have older staff and that kind of um, marries really well with our, with our resident population. So that's what we are. That's who we are. Thank you, Janet. Our, our next speaker is Dan Neary of Mass General Brigham Hospital. Dan. Good morning, everyone. So happy to be here, but Perhaps more importantly, thank you for, ha for being here yourselves. It's really great to see such a, an excellent turnout. I am a senior talent acquisition partner for Massachusetts General Hospital. Technically, I'm a Mass General Brigham employee. Um, that used to be Partners Healthcare, now Mass General Brigham. And, uh, but I recruit specifically for Mass General Hospital. And, and I've been recruiting for them for about 15 years and have been recruiting in general for 27 years. So I kind of sort of been around the block in terms of, of, of talent acquisition. Um, I think one thing that makes all of our affiliates um, within Mass General Brigham, but probably most especially Mass General Hospital so unique is the fact that we hire so many different kinds of employees. It's not just healthcare, it's food services, Police and security. We we hire a lot of security officers. Um, we also require we also hire plumbers, electricians, HVAC professionals. So it's not just healthcare, and administration is huge as well. We have about twenty seven thousand employees at Mass General Hospital right now, and about eighty thousand throughout the whole network. I would say we have well over a thousand jobs available right now, just to give you an idea of of, of the scope um, and the the broad bands that we're that we're recruiting for currently. So this never really gets old. I can tell you that um, I recruit specifically for nursing, um, but that um, I have a background recruiting from many different departments here at MGH, and a lot of the things that we look for for employees, I mean, age really isn't a factor with MGH. We have just so, we have such a diverse workforce. Um, I personally prefer, and many on our recruitment team do, prefer um, older workers because of the skills that they bring to the table. We just cannot find those skills, and, and, and as some of the, the previous panelists spoke about, we need those skills. We always cannot find those skills um, amongst younger workers. And um, you know, I work closely with the one of the event contributors, Operation Able, which which caters to the mature workplace as well. And I teach interview classes for them. I think you know, getting out ahead um, and speaking, um, we're doing some research um, online for interviewing is 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 key in, in helping out, um, you know, helping out and getting a position here at MGH as well. 
Um, and that's just really a, about it, um, other than the fact that um, I'm glad you were all here once again, and I'm personally honored to be here. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Now, uh, this is a chance for us to answer some questions uh, with the panel. And we, again, we encourage you to put questions in the chat. I have some general questions to get us started, but we'd like to take your questions also. A question that comes up every time we do one of these panels, I'm going to ask this one first, and any of you can, or all of you can respond. What tips do you have for people over 50 who are looking for work in this job market? So anything you can think of, job tips, training, credentials, posting, networking, resumes, give them some tips. Why do we have to think about this a little bit differently? So I welcome any one of the panelists to answer that. I will give you a few tips because I live in this world every single day. <laughs> one is don't put more than 15 years on your on your uh, resume. <laughs> um, and that's, I don't care who you are, don't put more than 15 years. That's, that's a giveaway. Um, I think you should... Um, in your resume, you should talk about not just regular skills, but the the, the wisdom you have. And that what is it that your expertise is that could help you solve the problem solving you could do? Focus on the things that are really important in in, um, in seeking a job, um, not just the skills that you have or the experience you have, but how you position yourself as someone who could either be a thought leader, be a problem solver, because those are the issues you know, if you look at young kids coming in, those are the things they haven't learned yet. They may have great tech skills and they may think, oh, this is how I do the job, but the wisdom is not quite there yet. So that's really, you know, important. And I also say, definitely you should network, but one key is to go back to all your old bosses <laughs> because they are, you know, that you have people there that know you and know the great job that you've done. And many of these companies say are having a talent gap issue. And uh, many of them would be happy even if you work part-time and because of COVID they're all okay with working remotely today so if you no longer live in that state where you used to work don't exclude it because there are employees who could be desperate for your talent hmm. good other panelists some tips for our job seekers well one of the one of the things I find too you know which is a little bit difficult to quantify but being confident um, I found myself out of work um, a couple of years ago. Well, through the pandemic, I was working in hospitality and uh, lost my position at that time. And I think it's, you know, it's so important to realize that you still have a lot to offer. Um, you know, keep your skills reasonably sharp as, as best you can. Um, stay up on your, you know, your computer skills, your software skills, but remind yourself you know, how many times have we said, nobody's gonna be interested in me or something to that effect, but stay confident and remind yourself that you still have a lot to offer. And I do wanna to add to that, I'm just quickly sorry, Dan. That's I'm okay. Thinking that one of the issues is I know a lot of people look, will go like a D to look for jobs and then they never get an interview. Don't be discouraged because even if you're younger, Indeed does a terrible job. Many say, oh, I'm, they never reached out to me because when I reached out to them, they can see my age. Of course, we'll never put more than 15 years. But I, don't be discouraged because it's not just you. It's all across the board and how job seekers can't find jobs. Right. Just to expand a little bit on, on the, what the other panelists had mentioned, too, is just keeping sharp with your interview skills and, and writing your resumes. The 15-year rule is, is a pretty good rule to follow, um, but really showing off your, your skills, you know, what you did at those jobs will make you stand out. But also practicing on um, virtual interviewing, because a lot of virtual interviewing is taking place right now um, through Zoom and, and Teams and a few others. Um, so I think that you're know, watching some videos on on how to um, succeed in a, in a virtual interview is key. That's that's one of the classes I teach with Operation Able as well. And it's it's so important to make that great first impression. Hmm. And, and a virtual interview would be very easy to do with. You could do it with a friend or you could do it with anybody. But I mean, being comfortable on Zoom is definitely a skill and it takes a while. So that's a really, really interesting. Those are all really great points. It took me a while, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I practiced. I did. I did. I practiced with friends, just like you said. Yeah. Yeah. I spend a lot more time putting on makeup when I do it, you know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. I am here and makeup show up show up here before this uh, before this meeting. So I that's hear. right. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question that comes up a lot and it's coming up in the chat also. Um, what does your company offer in terms of part time and remote opportunities? Now, some of you have mentioned this, but I think it's good to go back over it again. 
-hmm. So anybody can just jump in there. Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, oh, sorry, you, <laughs> had, you, had, you can share. You can go, Sharon. But, oh, I, I was going to say, all my jobs are remote, 100% mm -hmm. remote, so that people have the flexibility they want. And 60% of, of, our, of our companies have part-time jobs and 40% are full-time. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. We have, we have a mix. Um, I can't tell you the percentages because a lot of our jobs are in-person jobs, but um, I'm shocked that so many, even after like the pandemic, a lot of those jobs never went back, including mine. Um, mm -hmm. I work from home as well. Um, so we do have a lot of, of jobs that are remote now and hybrid. And I think another question in the chat was like location. So I mean, we have Chelsea, Revere, Everett, Boston, Danvers, and Waltham for Mass General. But then we also have Western Mass. Cooley Dickinson is a Mass General Brigham affiliate as well. Wentworth, Douglas, and New Hampshire. So, I mean, Mass General Brigham is definitely spreading out uh, through throughout New England, which is great to see. We have um, so many of our jobs involve direct care, which obviously can, you know is, is an in-person uh, role. Um, during the pandemic, so many of the jobs um, did go remote. Now that we're that we're you know back in full force again, we really have um, a lot of part-time positions, but more hybrid than fully remote. We don't have very many fully remote jobs here. Okay. We're getting questions of, about this 15-year um, gap. What about your college degree? Should you list the date? How should you handle that? You should never list the date of your college degree. It gives away your age. And I wouldn't even list the university you went to. Mm -hmm. That also creates bias. Huh. Um, oh, they didn't go to as good a college as somebody else. No, you list the years you went to college. You have a degree, what your degree is in. But I, I do not recommend um, you, you name your college or the year you graduate. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Now, we're also getting some questions about um, how employers view gaps in employment, um, such as dropping out for caregiving, maternity leave, COVID, whatever. How do we handle those on a resume? I, I think from the from my standpoint as an as the employer, I think that we've are really le so much less focused on that now than we used to be. I think that um, just about everybody that I've spoken to, in fact, I had that conversation just yesterday that just with, you know, life happens and with the pandemic and all sorts of other things that uh, you know, there's a lot less focus on that. Mm. Right. I agree. I think there is a lot less focus on that. However, at the, at the same time, you don't know which employer is going to you know, harp on that, so to speak. So I recommend that if you have a gap in your resume, put put something that you did, whether it's a volunteer experience or if you were a caregiver for a family member, whatever the case may be, if you're filling that that gap on your resume, that will always look better to to an employer, um, I feel. But yes, Mass General is 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 a lot less um, you know critical of those gaps on the resumes compared to where we used to be. I, know, I would. I always chill out. I recommend you definitely have to say what the gap was about, um, so that it's understood what you did. But also, I recommend that you say whatever else you did during that time to keep you you active. If you took some classes, if you did some volunteer work, so it shows that you still remained um, active in some way besides just being a caregiver. Mm. If that, if you have that kind of experience that you can put in there. So, I, so the more you put in there to explain it and what you've done during that time, the better that would be when they when they meet you. Yeah, you just never know. Never know who's going to, you know, kind of discriminate against that, um, yeah. fair or unfair. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question for Tim. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned Massachusetts was the first state to be CAFE certified. Um, we have people from other states. Do you know anything about any other states going through the same process? What I will say is there is significant state mobilization going on around the broader topic of aging. Um, I know that Colorado uh, last year also was added to the list of AERP's employer pledge, so I would call them out. Um, as far as other states, there are several more in the pipeline and in, in, in our pipeline. Um, so, you know, one of the things that has uh, surfaced, uh, and I, I know I've been doing this for almost 20 years and talking to hundreds of employers around the country. It was actually um, sort of a surprise to us to see how high 
the percentage of older adults is on most state payrolls. And it's very significantly high. So this is clearly an area, a, a, a door that's worth knocking on. And um, so, you know, if you're uh, in any state around the country, the likelihood is that the percentage of people working there over 50 is higher than the average. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, okay. Well, here's a question we can all chip in on. Um, someone on our listening audience has an interview tomorrow with a small business owner. How should I dress? Now, it doesn't, it must be a gentleman. It says suit with tie or without tie. I mean, I, I always figure you can't go wrong dressing in your Sunday best. Um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get uh, looked upon poorly at, when you dress in, in a suit. I'd rather go to an interview overdressed if there is such a thing than underdressed. In fact, I'm kind of embarrassed I'm not wearing a tie today, but I figured <laughs> this would be a little bit more, you know, a little bit more, you know, relaxed. But um, I, I feel as though, you know, suit and tie is, is the best way to go. And for for female, definitely, you know, a um, pantsuit or um, you know, something that looks a little bit more professional as opposed to business casual. Well, I, I, I have a slightly different take on it, depending on what the business is. Some businesses look a little, are a little more relaxed and they'd like to see a little more relaxed person. It's a small business. It's not corporate America. So I think you really sort of got to go to their website. I mean, never, never underdress. <laughs> never mm. underdress, that's for sure. Mm. But some companies, if you walk in with a suit and a tie as opposed to sport jacket and an open collar shirt. I mean, it, it depends. If you go to a tech company for an interview, I wouldn't walk, you know, you wouldn't, might not want to wear a suit and a tie. So I, I agree, you definitely have to dress but, and dress appropriately, but I would try to get a feel for the culture by going on. Before you go to any interview, you should go to their website mm. and understand the business, what they're looking for, so you can speak intelligently about it. Good advice. Um, we have a question for Salvador. Okay. Um, has the older adult segment been one the community colleges has targeted for some time, or is this a recent initiative? Um, I, I guess, the, the, and, and I'm a little unclear about the question, because I don't know if we're really just talking about the training programs that I spoke of, or actually colleges themselves. If it's colleges themselves, I would just tell you, my boss is 75 years old. So, you know, that I, I think it, in, in higher ed, it's welcomed, um, you know, in, in general. And we have uh, one of the women who's our nurse, he has been working here for 40 years. Um, you know, so I think that there's, there's great opportunity within the college. I think in terms of the, the programs that I, that I spoke about, I think that, that uh, some of you have already talked about this, but I, um, about the, the need for employees and why older workers create a benefit. But I wanna just flip that on the other side, because I don't think people know this, but on the other side, the high school population is decreasing. So between 2020 and 2030, we'll have 15 to 20% less students graduating from high school, which means on that back end, they're not coming in at the rates that they were either. So it's not only that there's this big explosion of, of job opportunities and, and so you're sort of in a buyer's market, but on the on the bottom end, that supply is not coming in like it has been in past years. So I think as an older worker, you have a great opportunity. And, and Salvador, I assume that a lot of the programs you talked about were relatively short in, in time in mm -hmm. requirements. Could you talk a little bit about that a little more specifically? Yeah, sure. I, I think we try, I, I have a, a sort of um, a goal with my programs and it's sort of like quickest to market, right? How, how quick can I get you in training and get you to a job, right? So generally speaking, we try to do most of our training in one semester, which is 15 weeks. And, and within that one semester, of course, can, like, as I mentioned, can be anywhere from 45 to 90 hours. In some cases, there's actually an externship um, in the healthcare programs, for example, where that, that could range from 120 to 160 hours. But in externships, those are generally 25, 30 hours a week when you're in those. So they go by fast. They go by, you know, four, six, eight weeks and you're in and out of them. So I think that, that for a lot of our programs, if, if people are interested in getting trained, there's a very quick return on that to get skilled up. And then the, the colleges generally have relationships with employers. And so we don't just train you and let you go. We try to help you find employment. 
um, you know, I'm not saying we're always successful at that, but we we do make the effort to try to get you employed and and build relationships with our employers to understand who they want and what the skill sets are needed for the jobs. Hmm. Good. Okay. Sharon, we're back to you with a, with a follow up question. Why can't, shouldn't you list your college on your resume? OK, um, because it creates bias. If someone sees you graduated from Harvard or you graduated from a college that has nobody even knows the name of. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's really, we, it's, it's just happens to be a bias. It's been a proven bias. And so the, even for young people, they're, t they're told not also not to put their mm. college name, you know, mm. on, on their resume because mm. people make assumptions that because you went to Harvard, you're smarter than somebody who went to a, a different college at Stanford. So, and that's not the case. There are a lot of very brilliant people even coming out of two-year colleges <laughs> So it does create a bias and improvement. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, there's another follow-up question here for any of the panelists, which also addresses education, which is how do employers view education, degrees, certificates from online training progr programs like edX and so forth? We're, we're okay with it at Mass General Hospital. I mean, if, if, if education is required, or for example, a bachelor's degree, um, it really doesn't matter where it is from, which could feed into the fact that you don't really need to list your college, right? Um, because we just care that you have a bachelor's degree. Um, I think we do like to see, I mean, I, I have to talk to some other recruiters in terms of that, you know, that issue of whether or not you should put the name of your school on there. I mean, I'm trying to think if I've seen many resumes that don't put the school on there, but it is an interesting, an interesting question. But those that you have a bachelor's degree, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, if you're if it's required for the job, and you're applying to that job, you want to make sure you have the proper education and certifications. You know, there, there's also a, a bit of a movement right now to um, not require college degrees when you put in the job ad, because what's happening, you're limiting your pool. I keep reminding some of my um, clients that I work with when they say, oh, I can't find talent. And I say, well, what are you putting on your job at? And they put a bachelor's degree required. I remind them that Steve Jobs dropped out of college. I can't tell you all, I mean, uh, Bill Gates dropped out of college. They don't have college degrees. You're wiping mm -hmm. out a huge number of potential candidates by requiring college degrees. I mean, some jobs absolutely do. Some jobs require an MBA because you're gonna be a CFO. Right. You know, but if it really isn't essential, you got to look at this. It's not essential to the job. You should not be requiring college degrees on your job ads. Yeah, Sharon. I mean, we're actually reviewing our jobs, our job descriptions right now for that very that that very great point that you brought up. Like, does this job, you know, does this job really require a bachelor's degree to do the work required? As you said, maybe for maybe for a nurse, yes, you have to have a a degree in nursing, and you know you have to have a bachelor's or at least a year of experience and the associate's degree. But there are so many jobs at Mass General Hospital that do you really need that bachelor's degree to do that job? And and we're reviewing them now, and and we've dropped that education requirement out of many of our jobs, mm -hmm. Sharon. So it is a very good point, and that's something brand new that we're going through mm -hmm. um, right awesome. now. You know why, Dan, why it's also important is because our older population, I could tell you the women, my, you know, the people I work, you know, who are waves, sure. so many of the women are brilliant, but they're in this late 60s, 70s. They never had a chance to go to college. They mm -hmm. got, you remember in the 60s, they graduated high school, they immediately got married, got a job, had children. Yep. They are so smart. And by requiring a college degree, you're excluding all these people yeah. who never had that opportunity back in the 50s and 60s to go to college. That's right. That's right. I mean, a bachelor's degree or any college degree is, is to me, not a sign necessarily of, of intelligence. Um, you could be brilliant and, and never have gone to school. I mean, you brought up Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, but just anyone, really, um, if they don't have that college background, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're going to be intelligent. And to expand on that point... Um, skills and experience. That's what older workers bring to the table is the skills and experience to us at Mass General. That's what's key. That's why we target um, almost, it's almost like you might think that you're being, you know, maybe discriminated against if you're an older worker, but no, we target them for that experience. And that 15 year rule of putting that year, those 15 years of experience is going to encompass what you did, you know, fairly recently over the past decade and a half. And that's what we want to see. So I, I completely agree. Tim, you wanted to comment? 
I did want to comment on this education point because I think it's um, getting at another topic which uh, sometimes goes unnoticed. And there are some things about older adults that are sometimes unspoken and you are it's in your interest to convey some of these things if you can. Education platforms like the ones that were mentioned, edX, for example, are technology platforms. If you are on those technology platforms, you are communicating to your employer that you are technology literate and you are technology friendly. And you have to convey that to these employers because they might think that you're not. It's a myth right. oftentimes, but you need to get that point across if you can. There's another couple of points I'll just mention on that same topic. One is your pay expectations. Employers sometimes are fearful of older adults because their pay expectations may be too high. And that's something that it's hard to communicate. You just want to get paid fairly for the job that you're performing. That's all you're looking for. And so, and then the one final point I'll say on this expectations thing is sometimes younger people, younger managers are fearful of hiring an older adult because the older adult might not be willing to take direction from someone 25 years younger. And you just have to communicate that that's not your style. You're happy to take direction from someone who could be 25 years your junior. So these are things that sometimes get in the way of older adults being hired. And if there are steps that you can take to get around those and head them off at the pass, you're going to be better off for it. Salvador, I think you had something to say on this topic too. Yeah, uh, you know, as, as a guy representing colleges, right, I think um, there's been, there's certainly been a shift in terms of um, the value that's given to degrees, right? And I would, I mean, especially as they relate to the cost of those degrees. Um, but I do think there's a couple of key points here. One is that there are some occupations that require them still. Right. So depending on the occupation that you you're looking at, you may need to get a degree, a very specific degree that happens, for example, in nursing, um, where you need to you need to have a, an RN. And now they even would like to see you get a master's. Right. Because some of that stuff is the, the work has changed. But I, but I also on on my side, which is the non credit side, we focus on industry recognized credentials. And I wanted to uh, use that term because in every industry, the industry has decided what's important, right? And, and there are lots of credentials that you can get that give you a leg up. So if you know the industry, you can go in and you can research what are the credentials that would give me uh, an opportunity to come in. And sometimes those are very short-term credentials that you need training in. So it's always good to understand that that uh, industry re recognized credentials are good. And what we're doing at the college here is we're sort of kind of combining both of these things. We're taking our industry recognized credentials and we're trying to pair them with our degree pathways so that, a, that you can get credit for prior learning. So once you, once you take the credential, a good example of this is we have a Google help desk a training program that sets you up for the A-plus certification. Once you get that A-plus certification, and you've demonstrated the knowledge, you then can get credits towards a, towards a, a degree in technology at the college. So there's, it, it, there's a lot of things that are going on around stackable credentials. And, and I, I just wanted to help people to, to know that they may already have credentials that could get them uh, towards a degree. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions around, around bias and different types of bias. Uh, one being, what about your address? What about your first name? I assume that means some type of an ethnic name. And also, what if you've had a high level position and now you don't want something with as much responsibility? So there's a, we're talking about bias that someone may see in looking at your resume. So anyway, I, I'll, hop in. I'll, I'll, I'll answer a few. I can answer all of those questions. I live mm. it every day. Um, <laughs> when, yeah, I would definitely take the street, your street. You don't need to have your street address on your resume. You can, you, you can list your city and state or just your, your so you, you probably need your city and your city or area and state. So they know if, if you're, if they want you to come into the office. They need to know you work near them or whatever, but you don't need to put your street address. Um, it's unnecessary. Um, a lot of people today are giving themselves a nickname <laughs> because they're worried about the bias in names. The bias is still real, unfortunately. Um, and I mean, it's getting less because so many people have stranger names today. I mean, people name their kids after colors, who knows what I know it's like, yeah. but it's still, it is definitely still out there. 
So you have to be, I would be very careful if you really have a very, very ethnic name. I mean, last names aren't as important any longer, but if it's a really ethnic name, you give yourself a, um, a nickname, a short, a short in the name to something like, that's only five letters that you pick out of your name. So it's still you. In other words, don't make something that's so not related to you so that you can forget it. And, and on the other side, if you if you feel you're overqualified and had uh, um, a, a, um, a very significant title, but you really don't want to do that kind of uh, work anymore, I how I would approach it is to say, you know, I've, I've already done my career path. I would approach it saying, I've finished my career path. I'm no longer on a career path. Um, and I just want to do what I love, as opposed to saying sort of, you know, I want a less stressed job, that might not be a great answer. A better answer would be that at this stage of my life, I've done my career, I've been my career path, I'm no longer on it. I just want to now do what I love and use the knowledge that I have to, you know, to continue to work. So that's mm -hmm. how I'd approach it. I just wanted to comment on the idea of the nickname or um, that that's really interesting. I actually haven't even considered that when I've looked at resumes. Um, but also too, if, if you focus on the kind of organization you want to be a part of, and so many companies now are saying that they value diversity and inclusion, equity. And if I were looking for employment at those types of places, I wouldn't, I personally would not be concerned about what they thought of my name. You know, I would, I would agree with you that, but a lot of companies, because I deal with so many of them, yeah. they pay lip service to it it still they don't realize the unconscious bias even though they say that there's so much unconscious bias when they see it that they're not they they speak it they speak yeah. it to them because they mm. believe it about themselves but they don't realize that this many people still have an unconscious bias to it yeah it's sad but true i think i think the whole important thing here is 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 trying to make yourself as marketable as possible taking out all those possible biases wherever you can um is 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 definitely helpful i mean at mass general hospital it's not a concern to us either and to anyone any anyone that i any resume i review i have seen a lot of resumes lately that are dropping the street address though so mm -hmm. i found that interesting they're putting the phone number some are just putting the email address i personally prefer the phone number and email address that's just me because I like, I'm a hands-on person. I like to make phone calls as opposed to communicate a lot, communicating a lot by email. That's just me. Um, I just like to get to the point. So it is interesting to see how everything is changing and evolving over the past two or three years. And I know that was mentioned um, earlier in, 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 the, in the panel or in this meeting, um, but it is so very true how many things have changed, um, changed dramatically over the three years. It's mm. crazy. More and more change in the last three years than I saw, you know, 10 years prior. Well, speaking of change, we have a very change worthy question. Should we have a website or a LinkedIn account if we're looking for jobs? I think you should have a LinkedIn account. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. If you're going for our jobs in design, you should have a portfolio or something as well. Um, uh, but yeah, LinkedIn, I highly recommend. And you can put that right in your resume too. I see that a lot in resumes too, of course. Yes. Hmm. Putting your LinkedIn. And again, you got to be careful then if you're using your LinkedIn, you got to be careful your LinkedIn doesn't give away your age. That's true. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Very true. Have, yeah. You have yeah. to manage that. So LinkedIn is great, but you got to manage that. What's in that LinkedIn is yeah. also reflected in your resume. And you don't go over, give away too much information. Mm. Absolutely. Um, save, save that for your Facebook page. <laughs> <You have to laughs> exactly. Put, exactly. But don't put it on your LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, be careful with your social media. Make sure mm -hmm. that you. You know, a right. lot of employers are checking. That's a good point, Sharon. A lot of employers are checking multiple social media right. accounts now. So you want to keep, you know, at least your profile picture and your background and whatever the people can see on the outside. I block everything. Um, but whatever people can see from the outside, you want to make sure is, uh, is, is, is pretty clean. Yeah. I, I will be honest. I looked all, you all up on LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you know how old I am because it is out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, another, 70. <laughs> another another good question also about technology which is that many jobs require people to fill in forms online but they're mandatory fields and, and some of the things we're talking about education years uh addresses names that type of thing is there any way to override any of that hmm. that's a real that's a big topic hmm. right now on linkedin um, so many job seekers are finding that to be so frustrating, you know, that basically being repetitive and 
typing in all the information that's on their resume and, and some things that will trigger some bias. Um, I personally don't know the answer to how, if there's a way to override that because I'm not that tech savvy, but um, it's, a, it's a real issue for people. Mm. I think it's going to, it's changing. I think um, there were so many required fields, even street addresses. I think um, um, from what I'm seeing, there's uh, such a pushback about having all these required fields that are unnecessary and to start um, making them optional. Um, also because you lose applicants that way. If you have to fill out so many fields that are unnecessary, applicants drop off. Right. I can tell you there's a huge drop off because of it. So a lot of companies are beginning to worry that maybe they need to re-examine how they're doing this because they, again, there are so many open positions today. You've got to watch what you're doing and make sure that you're not eliminating so many people because of how your requirements. Mm. A really good point. Uh, as way of a last question, I'd, I'd ask each of you this one. Besides being on our panel, have, yours, have you or your organization taken any other steps to attract older workers? I think that we've been, oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. Um, well, we certainly, in, in terms of our recruiting strategies, we, um, just trying to be mindful of the different job boards and sites that we're using, uh, retirementjobs.com, Leading Age is another one that has been pretty helpful for us. Um, our website and our, you know, make, uh, making sure that our certification as an age-friendly employer is getting a lot of um, notice out there. Um, you know, trying to be conscientious of those things. And um, we have a good, we have, uh, and that's chairman, we have a great tie to um, Operation Able, which again is, you know, one of the event contributors. And that keeps us in line, you know, that keeps us in tune with, with older workers as well, because I, I attend, I think it's like five or six times a year, I attend a meeting where we actually, we, we have actually listened to, to, to candidates um, that are presenting and we funnel them right into the recruiters where they'll be a, a good fit. Um, so that is you know, one of the things that Mass General is doing um, a, a, as a little bit of an extra, I feel. I, I also, you know, we also have uh, a few recruiters teach classes. As I had mentioned earlier, I teach a class on, on interview skills, for example, both virtually and in person. We're on, we're at, we're on retirementjobs.com. I mean, we've been with Tim forever. We, we, it's a wonderful program. We're also on the AARP job boards. We're on all the, wherever we can be to let retirees know that, you know, that's all we do. Our people are all over, I mean, not just retirees, but anyone over 50, 50 plus. Um, we use the AR, they, we use the AARP age. And, and so, and what we also do to attract people is we, we can't say it and how we, when we, people come into our site to apply, we, we, how do you say, how do we know if they're over 50? We can't, because you're not allowed to ask age. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we ask how many years of work you have. And if you have less, less than, and we use 25 years as a, 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 a the point where then you could apply because a lot of women took off time to have children. So if you started working at 20, 25 years, it'd only be 45. But we didn't want to, we wanted to accommodate parents who had to drop out for a number of years to raise children or to caregive or whatever. So um, so we try to we try to catch as big a net wherever we can be to people over 50 who are really now finding that ageism is affecting their ability to find work. Mm. Also, well, I have to thank all of our panelists and Kara and Tim and Salvador also. I mean, this has been very uplifting. Uh, if I weren't working now, I would be going, trying to call some of you as soon as we hung up. Um, I hope you've encouraged some of the people and, and given them confidence. I, the confidence was mentioned earlier. And as somebody who's done a lot of interviewing, I will, other people for jobs, I will say to you, confidence always wins. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important piece to act confident. Don't apologize for your age. You have experience. It's yep. much better to be very strong in what you're doing. And, you know, I've done, this is the seventh one of these we've done and we've had different people on and there are many organizations really interested and willing and want your experience. So try to keep that in mind as you go through this process. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. And thank you, Carol, for your wonderful moderating. And we want to thank our presenters. We want to thank our sponsors, AARP and the Age Friendly Institute. We want to thank all our collaborators. I want to thank Doug Dixon, who managed today's technology. Uh, we kept him busy and he kept up with it. So thank you, Doug. And I want to thank all of you participants for your wonderful comments, your wonderful questions. 
Uh, we could have kept going if we had more time. Feel free to put in the chat what you got out of today. We'd love to know that. And uh, as we said earlier, this is being recorded. We have the slides for you. We have the contact information and the websites for all of our presenters. We may have a few other links and resources. So stay tuned to your email. We will send you all that information shortly. Please take a look at the Encore Boston Network website. We have more information on job hunting and age-friendly resources, including the videos of any previous panels. So if you missed the one last November or a year ago, they're probably still hiring and feel free to look at that and see who else joined us and what they had to say. Uh, you can also look about at our upcoming programs. We have a couple more coming up. Next week, we are going to do one on how to find a job despite work history gaps. I know a number of you were looking for that. And then we're only also going to do one on how to write the next meaningful chapter of your life. And that includes job hunters, retirees, people who are keeping their jobs the same or their lives the same, but looking for something different. That should be a very exciting program. Again, I want to thank our attendees, our sponsors, and wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.